good afternoon thanks good afternoon uh, ladies and gentlemen dear colleagues so today my topic will be the clinical benefits of a novel non-resorbable membrane and i'd like to share my clinical experiences with permamem a uh, new membrane in guided bone regeneration so for long-term result and long-term stability around teeth and also around uh, implants we have to have a certain amount of uh, bone especially the facial bone is absolutely mandatory to have and also the level of the proximal bone is absolutely a key to success and it is always better to have a, a thick type of biotype than a thin type of biotype and if you want to have a real a, optimal environment then during the planning phase we have to estimate the situation correctly whether we have the required amount of bone and soft tissue or not and then we have to re-establish situations like we can see it here uh, if you want to uh, <clears throat> formulate a term what is guided bone regeneration and we want to be sure what are we today dealing with then the first strict criteria will be that today we want to exceed the borders of bone environment. So we don't want to go for those cases where in a well-established or well-maintained or healing bony environment, we can uh, use xenogenic particles with a collagen membrane in a way that we still remain in the well-existing bone environment. So what is regeneration? Regeneration means a reconstitution of a lost or injured part of an organ so that form and function of the lost structures are restored. Can we, and theoretically, is it a way to get a complete or only a partial regeneration can be achieved? Today, we are absolutely aware of certain knowledge that by guided tissue regeneration, we can have only a partial regeneration while for GBR cases, guided bone regeneration cases, we can have complete regeneration. And there are some many factors which tends to explain what the differences are between G GTR and GBR. So we have for GTR an almost not completely closed and almost open wound system. We have we cannot have sterile condition uh, during healing. Membrane stabilization is more difficult. The adaptation of the membrane is uh, difficult. Uh, to create space breaking conditions is difficult. Uh, and therefore, we have an overall estimation of this, that this has low predictability. And uh, what about for GBR cases? We can have better uh, conditions. Uh, and compared to GTR, we have not a compromised postoperative blood supply in those cases when we can have an appropriate flap design and uh, optimized wound closure. So when we go back to the basic principles of GTR and especially for GBR, we have to uh, understand that we have a, a kind of tissue compet a different uh, com a competition between different tissues and the uh, low uh, maturing tissues do not have the space and time for getting uh, regenerated and therefore we can mechanically control the situation in a way that if we uh, use a barrier for the low regenerative tissues then probably we can have a better healing and this is what we can see on the early publications that underneath a membrane uh, slowly uh, uh, growing our tissue formation can be demonstrated. And these are the milestones of uh, the first steps of guided bone regeneration. Then the first uh, clinical attempts and uh, in vitro animal studies were first introduced to establish conditions that uh, similar or even better results can be achieved uh, compared to GTR cases. And these are the publications where you have see where you can see the first uh, important, let's say, milestones of of this new technique. Uh, 
uh, we can we can go to a certain condition that today it is a well known and uh, absolutely successful treatment approach, uh, and finally we can have uh, very nice results and also uh, the flap advancement and flap suturing technique uh, uh, is being developed a lot. So this is a very advanced uh, condition of a certain patient. Uh, the patient has parasensation when removing the partial denture because the mental nerves was uh, almost completely empty. Uh, and uh, I realized that even the soft tissue is not enough. So a very thin soft tissue cannot provide a proper wound closure for any kind of bone augmentation technique. So uh, the first step was to reestablish the soft tissue profile of the defect. Then a stepwise approach was utilized under general anesthesia from Rarvus uh, Remo harvesting a uh, bone block was uh, positioned vertically and then fill out with spongious bone chips to have vertical support for non-resolvable uh, membrane for the titanium membrane. And this is the two layer closure above the titanium membrane and the collagenic membrane. And uh, this is the radiography. Nine months later, the re-entry uh, and you can see that histologically a very nicely formed uh, heart tissue can be demonstrated. And also it made uh, implant positioning feasible. And once again, the same two layer flap design. And this is prior to surgery and with the final prosthodontic work. You can see the radiographic conditions and the vertical dramatic change of uh, almost seven, eight millimeters of newly formed, vertically newly formed tissues. So we can say that this is, a, a, let's say, a successful treatment option, and we can maintain the result even after 12 years, and we can conclude the conditions that uh, if we have a proper prostodontic work, which is better to have instead of a, a implant level, uh, uh, prosthodontic work to work on abutment level, but even with uh, this kind of uh, prosthodontic work, we can uh, uh, provide the patient with a stable long-term stability. And uh, in Istvan Urban publication, uh, it was uh, 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 resulted this kind of success rate that after six years follow-up, a uh, 94% success rate, which is tends to have similar results than implant positioned in native bone in other two publications. And we can say that if we have a completely closed healing a GBR procedure with non-resolvable membranes results in similar success than those implants placed in native bone. However, we have still a very important issue that we still have to face to a complication-free postoperative healing. So if we have any kind of disturbed healing, then we can immediately go for advantages and disadvantages of using non-resorbable membranes. And I won't want to go into the technical difficulties of using a non-resorbable membrane that how the adaptation is and how to achieve an ideal configuration for the defect. But uh, the postoperative healing complications uh, are very, very important. And if we have higher rates of membrane exposures, that means that we cannot provide uh, patients with the same result that uh, was uh, mentioned before. And for those cases where we have an even an early exposure, the infection of the augmented area uh, cannot be avoided. Therefore, an early membrane, re membrane retrieval must be uh, uh, performed. And then uh, the uh, supra uh, uh, 
the vertical part of the augmented volume at least will be lost. So we cannot uh, 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 re-augment uh, the vertical part of the defect. So <clears throat> probably this, that uh, makes this procedure very, very technique sensitive. And there is an ongoing debate how to deal with uh, early exposures and how to deal with them in a way that still the vertical part can be uh, maintained and we are not facing to those conditions that uh, almost the uh, uh, regenerated area will be lost. This is another non-resorbable membrane, a new non-resorbable membrane, and this blue color uh, presents the so-called permamem membrane where we have an early exposure and this early exposure was handled in a way that after six months, there is no uh, 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 typical way of uh, growing the histancy. And as uh, you can see on the uh, right side, probably we can see a very uh, harmonious uh, infection-free condition of the soft tissue. So the development and evolution of non-resorbable membranes started with a, a technical uh, a bacterial filter, and that was the era to develop from uh, polytetrafluoroethylene uh, molecules in an expanded way. That was the early Gore-Tex membrane, and then to maintain the form uh, and uh, uh, structural supravertical integrity of the membrane that was uh, 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 provided by a titanium reinforced uh, uh, a titanium reinforced structure. And uh, beyond this titanium reinforced uh, Teflon membrane, titanium mesh was also utilized for uh, uh, larger defect augmentations. Today, we have a dense structure of uh, polytetrafluoroethylene molecules, and we have a newly uh, developed or introduced uh, dense uh, polytetrafluoroethylene structure, and this is the me uh, permamem membrane. Later on, we will go into the details how this membrane works and what, I, what, I, what kind of characteristics can provide probably better, better healing patterns than with other membranes. So if we are going uh, from the point that membrane exposure can, can be developed and uh, we want to, uh, we want to uh, walk on the safe side and avoid this uh, well-known side effect of, of the technique, then the question will be arise, uh, how to avoid, uh, reduce and minimize the risk of exposures about non-resorbable membranes, what kind of flat design can be utilized, how to achieve a proper wound closure with a primary intention wound healing. Can we use non-resorbable membranes in a, uh, let's say in a more safe way? What are the differences in, in healing pattern of healed and fresh post-extraction alveolar defects? And can we develop a more safe and a stepwise approach for advanced defect morphology? Flap design. So this is a, a condition where not only teeth cannot be maintained, but uh, we are facing to have a vertical bone loss after a series of teeth extractions. And this uh, radiography presents the supravertical uh, early conditions of the same defect after vertical augmentation, six months later, 11 months later, and we can see radiographically a well matured bone structure. Stepwise, uh, uh, the, the clinical steps of the vertical augmentation procedure. Uh, step, uh, the first step is the incision. This is a horizontally extended flap design at neighboring teeth without having vertical releasing incisions. A mid crestal incision along the edentulous ridge, a full thickness flap to the mucogingival junction and a partial sickness flap above, you can still see the periosteal layer intact on uh, the uh, hard tissue surface. Then mobilizing the periosteal layer, we can uh, use a 
uh, autogenous harvesting device. This is the so-called safe scraper. By this, we can have very nicely gained uh, uh, autogenous heart tissue in a particulate form. And this uh, can be mixed with uh, uh, xenogenic bone grafting uh, particles. Uh, it's better to have a little bit more autogenous particles, but we can go for a 50-50 particulate autogenous bone chips and xenogenic parts. Then the positioning of the non-reservable membrane above. And uh, you can see that we have two different layers. We have buccally the periosteal layer and the mucosal layer. And in an overlapping manner, both flaps will be closed so we have a very dense uh, flap closure in two different layers. And this is the final clinical view of uh, suturing the defect. And this is a short video, nine months later, when we uh, use the same mid-crestal incision. And then uh, the uh, dense uh, Teflon uh, membrane will be uh, removed, titanium pins will be uh, first removed, then the membrane, as you can see from the lingual part, and this is the newly formed heart tissue. And in this newly formed heart tissue, uh, the implant positioning, at that time I used three implants, today I would say two or more. So probably two implants for a bridge work are better than three. And this is the soft tissue augmentation with a xenogenic uh, collagen, uh, with a xenogenic material, and this is the mucoderm. And once again, the two layer suturing technique. So, nine months post operatively, you can see the soft tissue profile of the same uh, defect. And this is still the margin before, and this is the vertically gained tissues. And you can see the final prostodontic work with some uh, soft tissue manipulations that we have on both sides of the previous defect, keratinized mucosa, and what very important is non-mobile mucosa. And as I said before, we uh, on the sides we want to have, or at least we uh, are always uh, working with abutments and on the abutment, a screw retained bridge work will be uh, fabricated. So uh, if we want to have a same concept uh, as a part of a, a, a training course, we can use FIGJO models to demonstrate uh, uh, how the flap design uh, is going to be prepared. This is the buccal part of the edentulous phase of this pig model. This is this is me with the flap design, uh, and this is the periosteal uh, mobilization, the second layer. Then, where we have a tooth gum, we can have some invaginated connective tissue, uh, the uh, bone harvesting technique and this uh, scraped off autogenous bone chips will be mixed with xenogenic particles as one to one, mixing this uh, filling, uh, this uh, composite graft, the uh, uh, scaffold providing screws, because in this newly introduced membrane, we don't have titanium reinforcement, but we have a very flexible and very, very thin layer of unresorbable membrane. Titanium tax can provide the stability of the non resolvable membrane. And then we uh, fill out the uh, space between the tenting screws in a way that an absolute fix and safe and then densely packed uh, condition uh, will be achieved. And this is the two layer uh, closure closure, the periosteal layer will be sutured to the lingual part, and then as a second layer, the mucosal layer will be uh, sutured on the top. So we have two overlapping uh, flap sides above the non-reservable membrane. 
So uh, a clinical case for the same technique, as you can see, uh, we have some tenting screws. We have today better uh, scaffold providing or, or tenting functioning uh, screws. And uh, uh, this is how to, how to uh, uh, position the supra vertical part of the uh, defect and how to provide the membrane stability supra vertically and then the composite graft uh, will fill out the densely packed uh, and titanium pins uh, uh, adjusted membrane uh, condition and this is the two layer flat design. So this is the early wound healing but as we can see a complete uh, uh, wound closure with an absolutely closed healing condition could be provided. But anyhow, it could happen. So sometimes for some reason, if we could not estimate the defect morphology correctly, or if we uh, a little bit slightly overfill the defect, it could happen that we don't have a complete overlapping layers. And then we have a so-called early uh, uh, membrane exposure. But if we can, as uh, told before, achieve an almost six month stability of this early exposure, then probably we can uh, achieve better results. Why is that? Because we have an absolutely thin layer of uh, dense uh, 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 synthetic uh, membrane. Uh, there is a surface is absolutely uh, uh, does not allow any adherence of uh, bacterials. So we have a very, very clean surface. And the tendency for getting a population of bacteria on the surface of this, even in case of exposures, is clinically absolutely not visible. Uh, I'm not completely uh, agreed with uh, the, the term that no need for primary soft tissue closure, even not for socket preservation cases. I think it's always better trying to have a completely closed system. But uh, uh, this is absolutely true that this membrane is absolutely easy to fix with, uh, even with sutures or pins. And that could be an advantage that both sides uh, can, can have a position to toward the defect side. And uh, we can use this new uh, membrane for fenestration, dehiscence defects, and even for periodontal application as well. So the first is to have a proper wound closure above uh, those cases where we want to have a rich overlapping configuration of the membrane and how to, how to reduce the risk of using non-resorbable membranes. Uh, uh, probably uh, the answer can be given that if we are facing for those cases where the palatal or the lingual, lingual side of the defect is almost intact. We don't have to go for a real vertical augmentation, but only for a, a horizontal or minimally uh, uh, extended uh, lateral augmentation uh, above a, a titanium uh, implant, then probably uh, the laterally positioned membrane uh, can uh, achieve a better wound closure and therefore we can reduce the risk of early wound exposures. And this is a case where uh, uh, before uh, uh, starting the augmentation procedure, uh, a certain protocol was carried out to have a certain stability of the periodontal conditions. So from uh, uh, the side, which we are going to demonstrate right now, this is the lateral left maxillary side. Uh, that was the baseline, and from this, uh, this is a midterm condition of uh, doing uh, pretreatment, prostodontic, and periodontal protocol, and also uh, achieving uh, a nice and harmonious soft tissue uh, profile around uh, inserted implants. And this is on the side 
where we finally achieved uh, uh, resulted in a condition uh, during implant positioning that the buccal bone support was not uh, 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 given. So we have to augment the freshly inserted implant uh, buccal side in a way that uh, a real and uh, uh, well-established heart tissue will be formed. This is the positioning of the non-resorbable membrane. This is the same flap design. This is uh, the sutures. Nine months later, a complication-free postoperative healing. You can see the two different layers, the periosteal and the mucosal layers. And you can see after membrane removal that a certain amount of heart tissue uh, was formed. This is not too much, but that was enough to uh, provide these implants with a uh, healthy bony uh, halting. So this is also some flap, uh, 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 rotating flap uh, to provide conditions in a better uh, 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 supply with uh, non-mobile and keratinized mucosa. This is how the rotated flaps uh, from the retrieved side, you can see that we have a uh, open uh, condition and it can be closed with a, a, a xenogenic material that was a mucoderm which was adapted at the, in the posterior side and this is the early wound healing of the same defect and you can see the differences uh, before and after that we have more keratinized mucosa as you can see on this uh, schematic uh, uh, drawings uh, that probably also uh, during membrane removal, we were able to achieve better soft tissue conditions. This is another case uh, where uh, also uh, we uh, uh, are facing to a condition when a, a natural abutment cannot be a, a well in function for a long term, uh, uh, and therefore we have to. Uh, make conditions in a way that implant positioning will be feasible. The first step is to vertically augment the uh, conditions in um, uh, a staged approach. Sinus augmentation will be uh, uh, performed and uh, also a certain lateral augmentation at the same time with a non-resorbable membrane. Then for some reason, we realized that the canine cannot be kept. And after the uh, early healing, we decided to provide the implant positioning uh, in the posterior zone and in the delayed but early implant uh, positioning of the previous canine uh, uh, condition during uh, one surgery, and this is the navigated positioning of uh, these implants. You can see that we have a tendency for losing the outer buccal bony volume, which is not surprising. So for those cases where we are facing to uh, frontis or even uh, a canine, uh, as a, uh, uh, absolutely having an outstanding profile of the alveolar reach, uh, after tooth extraction, we are going to face to the typical condition of this. So a uh, lateral augmentation technique uh, will be uh, provided during uh, uh, the surgery after implant placement. And uh, this is the radiographic conditions. This is the healing uh, six months later. And we can see that uh, beyond the membrane, a newly formed heart tissue was developed. And uh, you can see that uh, at the sites where the implant were, were positioned in well-healed bone, some uh, slight uh, alveolar ridge dehiscency de de was occurred. Therefore, some uh, autogenous bone chips was applied and then some xenogenic material and the same membrane, membrane was positioned once again. So this uh, uh, laterally positioned or buccally positioned membrane configuration, a little bit apart 
of the mid-crestal incision can help to uh, achieve uh, to uh, get early uh, wound healing uh, complications and also a kind of uh, uh, stepwise approach uh, when we are facing to an early uh, or even a fresh extraction site can be followed to uh, have uh, better uh, and more safe reconstructions of the alveolar ridge. So what uh, do we mean under uh, differences in healing pattern of healed and fresh extraction sites? So this is also a periodontal patients who underwent perioprostodontic complex rehabilitation. And this is uh, two years later, uh, stable conditions. Some seven years later, as you can see, uh, periodontal defects developed at the right side. Therefore, periodontal therapy was performed. But after uh, nine years, so nine years after the first uh, complex rehabilitation, uh, we get a fracture on the left, uh, at the left canine, and uh, some periodontal tissue breakdown. So the first uh, incisor could not be kept, and that was the condition that from the upper second uh, incisor up to the uh, second uh, premolar on the contralateral size, only uh, another second incisor could be uh, stabilized, and this is not able to perform a fixed uh, prostodontic rehabilitation. So we went for implant therapy, and this is the first fresh extraction site, the vertical fracture, uh, and some modification in a way that the uh, this type of alveolar present, uh, preservation, it will be uh, severally discussed later, can result in a condition that the outer profile of the bone can be maintained or even reestablished. You can see uh, that was the first step, but the infection could not be eliminated. But there is a huge difference when we trying to counteract the natural healing process after a fresh extraction site. So we have, uh, uh, we have the canine and we have the first incisor. And on the canine side, you can see that the outer profile is maintained, but we have an infection inside. And that can be uh, filled out with uh, the composite graft. And uh, uh, non-resorbable membrane can cover up the defect. And this is the healed side, uh, and we can position the uh, uh, implant very, very safely. That is the first, uh, that is the second surgery for this, this side. And we can see that some further lateral augmentation was needed at the uh, first incisor to reestablish the buccal bony arch, but the same membrane positioning was used that only the buccal uh, bony part was covered. You can see that later, uh, nine months later, we have a well-established alveolar ridge. And at the augmented site, we have enough bone that uh, finally it resulted in a good healing. I would say the uh, first therapy with uh, alveolar presentation, uh, I like it better because the alveolar ridge is being restored and not only augmented at the implant site. But this is a rotated flap to ensure a proper soft tissue and uh, keratinized alveolar, uh, alveolar mucosa supply for these implants. And this is the final outcome. And by this, we can uh, achieve a stable condition for implant bone prostodontic uh, final work. Alveolar ridge preservation with this novel uh, excess flap design. So when uh, we want to uh, summarize uh, very, very sim simply what is going to happen in most of the cases where we are facing to those conditions where we don't have a well-defined alveolar ridge, but on the outer uh, buccal bony uh, uh, layer, we have only a bundle of bone which is related to periodontal bone. 
and during tools development, it will create in most of the cases in the upper front the uh, buckle bony plate of of uh, those frontis. So we have a tendency for uh, a reduction during the first three months, and this uh, uh, can finally end up in the condition that orovestibularly up to fifty percent uh, we will have a, a a dramatic change of the horizontal dimension of the defect and a certain uh, one to two millimeter vertical shrinkage uh, can be also achieved. In the early wound healing event, we, we will have a soft tissue healing up to six weeks and the any kind of infection will be eliminated during this early healing time. So therefore, the ideal condition is to contract this non-advantageous uh, bone outer remodeling uh, after six weeks. This is a condition where we perform the patient with implant therapy and uh, episectomy uh, treated uh, lateral uh, remolar was uh, in getting an uh, acute infection and this uh, situation resulted in an acute infection that the buccal bony plate was completely missing. And with an alveolar preservative technique, we could regain more buccal uh, bony plate than previously existed, as you can see clinically. So this is the uh, so-called excess flap. As you can see here, this vertical excess flap does not uh, end up at the end of, at the end of the papilla, but it is at the basement uh, uh, of the papilla. So we have a two millimeter apart. Uh, uh, we will finish the vertical axis. We prepare a two layer uh, configuration, a superiostal and a mucosa layer above the periostal layer. We can uh, pull in in a tunnel like uh, fashion. Uh, this new non-resorbable membrane. We can also use some uh, like a panting function of the non-resorbable membrane, some xenogenic particles, as you can see here. And above this non-resorbable membrane to switch the biotype or even to have a better uh, uh, soft tissue profile, we can use a xenogenic soft tissue augmentation material. This is the mucoderm. <clears throat> this is the uh, baseline, this is the two weeks healing, this is the six months uh, post-operative healing, and this is the CT control of the same defect. As you can see here, the ridge is going to be re-established and we can go for the second surgery. How the soft tissue profile was changed, we, can, we have a slight shrinkage of the keratinized tissue at the edential ident space. And we have, however, a slight uh, kind of transparency or, or uh, 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 kind of uh, uh, suspect that we have a better heart tissue uh, formed condition, as you can see here. And this is uh, absolutely the layer where the non-resorbable membrane uh, could end up and we have a absolutely ideal condition for implant positioning. If we still have a non-supported buccal bony wall, so we ha don't have a two millimeter uh, bony housing apart the uh, freshly inserted implant, then we can have a lateral augmentation and the membrane does not have to be removed because it still has its structural integrity due to the fact that this is a non-resorbable membrane. So this is once again the schematic drawing of the same. You can see the uh, uh, augmented, laterally augmented side and the non-resorbable membrane can be positioned above the non-resorbable membrane. This is the final wound closure. So this stepwise approach can be used for even larger defects where we have a, a completely missing buccal bony uh, plate, or even we want to have a better palatal 
regeneration or lingual regeneration during defect healing. But we, we are facing sometimes to compromised conditions. So this is the same philosophy uh, which I prefer for uh, highly aesthetic cases where I don't want to have uh, any kind of major complications. So the first step is to use uh, uh, alveolar preservation technique as I presented before. This is the soft tissue profile uh, after wound closure. This is the uh, regained palatal bone as you can see here. Uh, this is the soft tissue profile of the same, uh, a better uh, soft tissue condition six months after. Uh, a laterally intended uh, bone augmentation to achieve more buccal bone than previously existed. Uh, a dense non resorbable membrane was positioned and filled out with the same composite graft uh, covered by a collagen membrane trying to avoid the risk of having this uh, non-resorbable membrane in an overlapping fashion and this finally resulted in a almost uh, acceptable uh, heart tissue condition uh, we went for a, a navigated positioning of implant as you can see here we have almost five or six millimeter uh, bone left and the cytoplast, the non resorbable membrane is still intact. So uh, we uh, position the implant in a navigated way and we can even a little bit over augment the same to have a better buckle uh, bone supply. And uh, after uh, six months of healing time, the second re-entry, the two layer preparation and you have a rigid a little bit scar-like tissue por formation of the periosteal layer and after removal of the non-resorbable membrane a very scary condition occurred that it is highly likely that the non-resorbable membrane was pushed a little bit apart and therefore the previously filled out defect disappeared and we have once again uh, only a bridge-like formation at the Cresta region, which exists and epically, practically nothing. So once again, uh, this ultra thin layer in a very safe and careful flap mobilization could be utilized that we can have uh, once again, a lateral augmentation above the uh, exposed surface of the titanium. And this is the soft tissue healing and nine months later, so that was the time and I was a little bit uh, uh, embarrassed to, to have this kind of crestal uh, one and a half or almost two millimeter crestal bone uh, recession or not completely covered condition. And therefore, once again, we agreed with the patient uh, on a further crestal lateral augmentation, but at that time, I decided that this ultra thin layer uh, is not too risky to have uh, and uh, to position it in an overlapping, ridge overlapping configuration. And this is the final condition of the same defect. So, this kind of compromised healing could be, uh, how to say, tricked out in a way that uh, probably we haven't lost all the structures and we could rebuild. But this, the number of surgeries and the uh, in-between surgeries, the time plays also an important role. So finally, I could say that was not uh, a failure for me, but it was also a failure for the time consumption of the whole process. What about, what about for those cases where we cannot have a completely closed healing? And this is uh, the uh, final surgery of a, a very advanced defect morphology. The patient has two incisors which were completely infected. And due to the uh, pathology of the defect and the outspread of the defect morphology, the second incisors were also involved. The patient uh, could not agree with me on removing all 
the four incisors. Therefore, we removed only the uh, mesial incisors and we did the same alveolar preservation technique. As you can see stepwise here, the uh, tunnelized two uh, different layers design and uh, using only um, uh, collagenic uh, uh, loose structure of sponge to fill out the defect. This is the wound closure. This is the early wound healing. There is a tendency, a slight tendency to get the proximal bony wall slightly to recover, but uh, that was the time when I, I absolutely uh, uh, disagreed to perform any kind of bone augmentation because we don't have the proximal bony walls. Therefore, I co uh, convinced the patient that a second similar surgical uh, 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 wound opening uh, must be performed, trying to achieve a closed healing for the second incisor's proximal mesial bony walls. And this is uh, a kind of condition that uh, non resorbable uh, titanium uh, supported uh, uh, buccal bony ball uh, was uh, uh, used with covering uh, a resorbable uh, uh, membrane like material to have the same uh, situation. And it finally ended in a condition that the proximal bore was acceptably regenerated. The patient still existed on maintaining the second incisors. And then we started with the uh, vertical bone augmentation. These are the, once again, the new tenting screws for the permanent membrane. You can see the uh, uh, effect fill in the suprabony part with the composite graft and the overlapping uh, membrane uh, structure filled out with the composite graft and fixed by titanium pins. And here, the uh, two layers uh, flap design, but I could not provide the patient in a completely uh, overlapping flap, uh, 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 completely closed overlapping flap design. So the periostal layer had a slight dehiscency Either this or the proximal uh, neighboring two side resulted in a not completely closed healing, although the flap closure looks quite acceptable. This is uh, after three weeks of healing or uh, after probably four weeks of healing, but uh, somehow three months later, uh, exposure is at least not growing. And I think this is a very interesting and unique uh, feature and phenomenon that neighboring a tooth side, we still do not have a tendency for any infection and conditions with a, a surface cleaning and chemical plug control and clinical uh, rinsing and, and cleaning, it can be uh, maintained in a healthy condition. And finally, uh, uh, I think a very, very interesting case to demonstrate uh, the different healing pattern of the newly introduced non-resorbable membrane and the previous uh, non-resorbable membranes. You can see uh, the schematic drawing, how this uh, vertical augmentation will be performed. Once again, this uh, typical uh, horizontally extended flap design the lingual part and the dissected periostal and mucosal layers, the bone scraper to achieve uh, autogenous bone particles for uh, heart tissue augmentation as part of a composite graft, and then mixed with the xenogenic particles, the uh, defect fill, and as you can see, just uh, behind the last uh, uh, tooth, uh, which is adjacent to the defect. This is slightly vertically overfilled. And could happen that the uh, wound closure was not completely 
covered, it could happen that we had a slight tension between the first layers, but finally it resulted in an exposed healing, uh, so an opened uh, healing, and this membrane exposure uh, could be kept under control for six months healing time. This is after six months, and as you can see, this six months healing time doesn't have a tendency for having infections at the sites or dissected conditions above or uh, beneath the membrane. And a newly formed uh, keratinized tissue would develop. Nine months later, uh, it looked like that. So there was a secondary uh, flap exposure after six months. I would say after six months, we have a well matured uh, bony uh, formation inside. And when removing the non resorbable membranes, it really looked like a well matured and hard like tissue layer. And uh, the sides were covered by a collagenic membrane without uh, trying to uh, close the flap sides. So uh, we repositioned the flap sites as previously they existed. And this is the soft tissue healing with a very nice uh, keratinized tissue profile. And this is the hard tissue fill nine months later uh, before doing the second stage uh, surgery, the implant positioning. And you can see that even above the uh, previously existed uh, uh, hard tissue peaks, the native bone, a newly formed heart tissue can be maintained and radiographically it looks like a well uh, uh, healed and well uh, very, uh, well uh, uh, oriented newly formed heart tissue. So probably this kind of uh, new membrane is not so sensitive for exposures and we can have a better uh, defect feel even for those cases where we have an early exposure. For defects extending out of the alveolar ridge, still non-reservable membrane can present predictable, uh, predictable result. I think uh, predictability really needs a non-reservable membrane. The risk of flap dehiscency and membrane exposure can be minimized or reduced with positioning the non resorbable membrane, trying to position it only buccally. If the buccal bony plate is not completely uh, uh, given or the uh, bony housing uh, does not present two millimeter uh, native bone apart the positioned implant. If we are facing uh, to those conditions where a fresh extraction site will be uh, treated, then a stepwise approach, alveolar preservation, and eventually, if needed, a second lateral GBR procedure can be performed. In case of those conditions where we still have an overlapping membrane configuration, that means that uh, we need uh, a certain, uh, up to a certain amount of vertical or even an advanced horizontal vertical augmentation, a proper flap design is required. However, if complication occurred, membrane exposure can be kept under control and the newly forming heart tissue won't be lost. And probably this is a message, a very, uh, I hope, honest message that uh, this kind of uh, approach can be applied in a more safe way and uh, even exposures uh, does not ring uh, a bell for everyone that uh, non-resorbable membranes must be rather avoided to avoid these kind of risks, high risks. By this I want you thank you for your kind attention and if you have any kind of uh, 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 questions or or uh, only uh, interest further interest please send a message and i try to answer these questions or comments sorry for uh, not mentioning the suturing technique 
and I think it is a very, very uh, interesting part of this. So we use 4.0 sutures for the periosteal layer and 5.0 sutures for the mucosa layer and even a 6.0 sutures as a continuous sink, sling suture can be used as a third uh, suturing layer. Uh, probably uh, EPTFE sutures are better uh, to avoid any kind of plug uh, accumulation. And I think uh, basically uh, this is what we use for heart tissue augmentation. And we have another question, and this is uh, not concerning the suturing technique and suturing materials. For the situation with lateral or vertical ridge defects, how to avoid damaging the mental nerve buccally if you need to advance the buccal flap? I think this is a very important issue, and therefore we did some anatomical basic uh, uh, preparation, and we have today a better and deeper understanding that the different layers, if you prepare the flap design in dissected layers, you have a periosteal layer and you have a, a dissected mucosa layer, then it is highly likely that you don't have a complete damage of the mental nerve. So the mental nerve and any kind of basic structures has a tendency to run uh, longitudinally uh, to the body and not uh, transversally. So we have some anastomosis transversally. And therefore, if you remove the mucosa layer, it could happen that some anastomosis will be disturbed and dissected, but it can be regenerated. So I did not have any kind of uh, patient where we have a mental nerve, nerve uh, uh, complication after surgery. Uh, and there is another question, cost of such treatment. What do you mean? A cost of uh, a stepwise approach or, or a cost of a comprehensive uh, rehabilitation of a perio patient? Or uh, I would say if we go for a stepwise approach, that means at least one uh, 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 alveolar preservation is needed. And this alveolar preservation will be the first surgery. It depends on, on cost of material. Uh, so if you charge for the material costs uh, separately, then uh, it depends on what, uh, what kind of cost in your country you have. But the cost of material uh, comes to that uh, extra. So uh, you charge for the, uh, for the material costs as well. And vertical augmentation, I would say if you want to install a few implants and you don't have the bone for that and you charge uh, one or two implants for that, that could be accepted as a cost of a vertical augmentation as well. Do we have some further questions? And if not, then I would like to thank, uh, sorry, the last one. If tissue sickness is thin biotype, it, it, would, it would be much more easy to cause membrane exposure. Yes, I absolutely agree with you. So therefore, I wanted to go for always as a first surgery to augment the soft tissue or for those cases where we are dealing with a fresh extraction site, as you, as you can see before, we uh, not only reestablished the buccal uh, bony uh, 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 contour, so we used a non-resorbable or a long-lasting resorbable membrane, but we also did a soft tissue augmentation. So I think to switch the biotype or before doing any kind of any kind of uh, vertical augmentation to go for the so-called uh, uh, technique, which was uh, first introduced by Langer uh, and Langer to uh, provide the defect dehiscency with a soft tissue augmentation could be very, very useful.
uh, how is the blood supply accomplished? Very good question. If we have dissected layer, there is a tendency that uh, the periosteal layer without vertical releasing incisions, but horizontally extended flap design could be pushed apart and then resutured. And therefore the blood supply of the periosteal layer is almost intact. And then we have above this a supraperiosteal mucosal layer. And also due to the fact that this is not vertically disrupted, but today I would say for some reason, if you only cut the uh, the mucosa layer vertically that you don't have a really disrupted uh, blood supply, uh, you, you can have a very nice uh, healing. What if infection occurs? To be honest, this dissected and then suture by suture uh, re-established uh, 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 flap design does not have a tendency to have uh, several infections. I, I can give a post-operative uh, antibiotic protocol as uh, in most of the cases in augmentation situation is needed, but I don't have severe uh, uh, infections. What I have, sometimes I have exposures, to be honest. Uh, does the membrane integrates with, with the soft tissue? Very good question, I forgot to mention that this blue dense membrane does not have a tendency to get integrated. So it's very, very simply to remove. And this is uh, absolutely an advantage compared to, let's say, uh, titanium mesh or titanium uh, uh, grid-like uh, membranes where you have ingrowth of the connective tissue. And therefore, this titanium mesh and grids is very, very hard to get removed. So this dense, newly introduced uh, permamem membrane is very simple to get uh, removed. So finally, we had several questions. And one, I want to thank you for, for your kind attention. And once again, thank you for listening to me.